All right, and welcome to Fast Break Breakfast MBA Podcast. My name is Keith, here alone for a solo interview podcast. The full episode with John and Chuck will be out later this week, most likely on Thursday, keeping that Thursday day as our full squad episode. Uh, sorry I didn't give you a solo episode last week. You know, juggling life. Right now, uh, the podcast is prisoner to my youngest child. And if that baby's sick, that kind of ruins the podcast. And I've hit a point. I've hit a point of my life where if that baby's sick, yeah, I'm not probably not going to give you a podcast. I'm not going to uh, move heaven and earth anymore uh, to create this. I'm sorry. I apologize. I appreciate all the listens. Everyone, our, our Patreon supporters over at patreon.com slash fastbreakbreakfast. But, you know, I've been trying to balance the life a little bit better, trying to make the wife a little happier, trying to make my kids, you know, a little, uh, maybe a better dad. Uh, and some of that... Uh, came to fruition on Monday night. I, I, as I'm talking right now, recording this intro to the interview I did with David Roth earlier today, I didn't watch any basketball yet. Uh, it's almost 11 p.m. Central Time. I'm going to try to catch up. The Grizzlies beat the Lakers. That is hilarious. Uh, Grizzlies tickets were so cheap to see LeBron James. Unbelievably cheap on the secondary market. If you waited until the last second to see LeBron James and lo and behold, the Grizzlies won. I did not see a second of the game. It is literally the first Grizzlies game all season. I've completely skipped. Did not watch it at all. I went out to play some ultimate Frisbee. That's right. The bane of John and Chuck's existence. My playing ultimate Frisbee. I played it. Uh, I'm like, you know what? I can't be slave to watching these NBA games on. I love watching basketball. I love tweeting about basketball, getting that engagement. But, you know, I've been so angry about the way the Grizzlies are being run. The Grizzlies, who I believe are now in the plot of the movie Major League, I have I believe the conspiracy theory that they're trying to tank the fan and... Uh, the, they're attacking the support of the fan base. Every time they roll out Chris Wallace to give a press conference, knowing it enrages everybody, I'm starting to believe that they're tanking their fan base. However, I didn't watch the game, and they beat the Lakers. I did pick the Lakers to, uh, you know, I picked the Grizzlies, excuse me, to cover in our Pickle Pick'em Challenge with our other Patreon supporters, only because the support for Lakers minus five seemed so overwhelming and uh, John has taught me you got to go the other way. You got to follow the money, go the other way. So I thought, you know, just for that, the Grizzlies might cover. But the Lakers losing, this is a mess. And that is what we talked about uh, on this episode recorded earlier on Monday afternoon with David Roth about how the Lakers, this is a nightmare. Things are falling apart. We also talked about a ton of stuff. Uh, to be honest, the interview took. 10 minutes to get going to basketball. We just talked about weird, random stuff. Uh, David is really fun to talk to, so hopefully you will enjoy that. But again, now I have to go catch up on this Grizzlies game I missed since they won uh, and figure out what else is going on in the NBA tonight. I know the Spurs lost again. The Spurs are in danger of missing the playoffs. The Spurs are in trouble. They're actually happy the Lakers lost because, uh, you know, things are kind of tight. Like the Rockets, the Jazz... Their spots are not guaranteed by birthright that they will be in the playoffs. They are uncomfortably close to the Clippers and the Kings and even the Lakers, although the Lakers are still way on the outside looking in. Uh, We're starting to come to grips with the reality that LeBron James came to the Los Angeles Lakers and they're not going to make the postseason. It's wild. Uh, My my shout in Florida is up right now as I'm scrolling through Twitter trying to catch up what I missed tonight. But uh, it's good stuff. So I hope you will like this interview. Again, we talked about a bunch of crazy stuff. It's kind of long um, for us, maybe 35 minutes. Uh, and we talked about a lot of uh, divergent topics before we got to the NBA. But you guys like that kind of thing. So hope you'll enjoy it. If you want to support our show, like I said, patreon.com slash fastbreakbreakfast is a great place to do it. Also, if you're buying tickets for any event, seatgeek.com. 
go there. They collate all the other secondary ticket sites to show you what the best deals are. There's a color-coded system, very easy to use. And the bonus, if you use our code FASTBREAKBREAK, same as my Twitter handle, you get $20 off your first purchase. Luckily, I sold my Grizzlies Lakers tickets a little early, sensing the market was probably going to soften. I uh, priced them aggressively a few days ago, got an okay deal for them. But uh, if you are the person buying the tickets, SeatGeek will show you those best deals. They will show you when uh, tickets are getting cheap. And if you're going to an NBA game or a hockey game or comedy or music, you can buy your tickets there and they'll show you the best deal. Plus, you get $20 off. You cannot beat that deal. You support our show when you use it, and you get $20 off your purchase. So SeatGeek.com, use the SeatGeek app, use our code as the promo code, FASTBREAKBREAK. Support our program, get money back in your pocket. SeatGeek.com, use our code, FASTBREAKBREAK. All right, now let's talk to David. My guest today... He's an editor for Deadspin and the host of the Deadcast, and many fine people are now calling him Demon Dave, David J. Roth. That's uh, you really pluralized Corbin very casually there. Well, I mean, that is Corbin Smith. He told me to do that, and I don't know why I did him that, but there you are, David Roth. How's it going? I'm doing all right. You know, uh, I have one of my nemeses is trying to give me a new nickname online. But other than that, things have mostly been OK. Yeah. Well, I you know, I've known Corbin longer than you. You is that true? seem yeah, more important. I'll say it. So, you know, it's OK. I will. If I have to side with loyalty over importance, I'm going to go importance most of the time. All right. I mean, I'm just saying that uh, if it weren't for me, uh, Corbin would be out there in the woods burying basketballs and uh getting getting bits of um humus in his beard is right? I'm, like, i might have misunderstood completely is that not what corbin is doing no no he sometimes he gets paid for it now oh well, that's and cool I, I, I started that trend oh that's there not, you go yeah i have a lot to answer for no he's a he's a he's a good dude he's allowed to nickname me whatever he wants he sent me nine thousand words on the jailblazers that i have to read uh, that is something I'm looking forward to. I don't know why we're promoting Corbin so much. It's my fault, obviously. Yeah, Corbin but, Smith. Uh, Corbin Smith, the host of Should Take It or Break me- It. I was going to say, can we mention his podcast? <laughs> yeah, uh, he, that's, he, that's I, I do know that Corbina he wrote Smith. a very long Jailblazers piece that's coming out eventually on, on Deadspin. So, yeah, I would say eventually. It takes a long time to edit 9,000 words, but I'm excited for it. I wonder if he will uh, get the, the MAGA crowd as riled up as his last big piece. Oh yeah, he got in yeah, a lot was... of internet trouble. Had to lock his Twitter, uh, and then it got weird. After he locked it, he got extremely tangy, uh, <laughs> like enough that you'd remark upon it. And it was uh, it was good. Locked Corbs is really on some shit. Now he's back to being like a, a good boy and popular. He again. is back to a good boy. Uh, so he he wrote a piece again. We'll get to basketball eventually. He wrote a piece, you know, about the Patriots being the team. Of, of the, the alt-right, or just the, the, the Make America Great Again camp. Uh, I, assume, I don't know if he's going to take a, a victory lap with the Robert Kraft allegations. It seems like, it's, like it's time for him to, you know. It, it does seem like the sort of thing that's, like, uniquely, like, suited for him because there's, like, some sort of, there's, like, a squalid sexual perversity element, which is where he, I found he really flourishes. Right. And then there is that other thing with the Patriots. But I don't know, I mean, do you really want it with a bunch of Patriots fans in the Menchies? Well, I, like, I, I it, mean, no, you don't want it, but then why did he write that other incendiary piece? And, and I think it, he did want it. Okay, he wanted it. I, yeah, I think a little bit. I mean, just to say, and, but now, you know, who knows? I, I Whatever. He's a, a a great guy and a fantastic podcaster, and I, you know, I feel like, if anything, we should invite him to join us for the rest of this conversation. <laughs> I would if it wouldn't take me, like, you know, uh, having to call him and then figure oh, this out and, and squeeze this into the remaining 20 minutes of this exciting talk. All right. So let's just get to the other. Let's get to um, the other. Any, any, any other bloggers you want to talk about? Any other? Uh... <laughs> no. <laughs> no, not at all. I want to talk about David Roth, and I want to talk about the NBA. I also want to talk about breakfast. Did you have breakfast today? I always do. Um, I feel like this is going to be the thing that uh, it's probably, I mean, I don't even know. We did just talk about Corbin for five minutes. But I think this is going to be the most boring uh, part of the thing because I had, I think, probably the same breakfast today that I had when I was on with you several months ago. Well, conveniently, I don't remember what it was. 
Oh, good. All right, cool. That was, I was hoping that you hadn't written it down or something. <laughs> no. uh, a couple, couple pieces of toast, cut up an apple, a couple of little cheese chunks, a cup of coffee. That's good. And, and water. I drink a lot of water. That's good. That's, uh, that's honestly almost exactly what my Red Dead Redemption 2 character ate for breakfast. <laughs> oh, God. It's straight, it's just bread, yeah. apple, coffee. That's what me and my horse uh, had. That was, yeah. That was... Did he have, I, I don't have any pemmican around the house or. <laughs> <laughs> but corn pone or whatever but yeah yeah uh so let's talk uh we met in nashville briefly uh you came here with the deadcast it was fun i assume you have nothing but glowing things to say about my city what what was your what was your final wrap-up uh, i like nashville man i wish i'd gotten to you know find a, a sort of I don't know. Like, I, I don't think I really got a sense of it, which is, of course, the case when you're at any place for like 36 hours. Right, yeah, yeah. Uh, but it was great to see you. It was great to see Jesse Farrar. They're the only two people, you two are the only people I know that live anywhere near that city. Uh, and you guys both did not disappoint. And it was, we had a fun time. Like, the hot chicken I tasted was fantastic. Like, the podcast itself went pretty well, I think. But it was, I don't know, it's weird. Like, maybe this is just, you could probably tell me more about this. The sense that I had, we did, um, the show at a like a barcade sort of thing that was down where all the country music clubs or a lot of the newer ones are. Mm -hmm. And that whole neighborhood felt like it was about an hour and 20 minutes old. <laughs> so you, you guys did it at, yeah, at a barcade, which is, which is relatively new, but you guys were just like two blocks away from the classic honky tonks that have been there forever. Yeah, winners and losers, right? Right. Well, so so well, winners and losers is more. That one's farther away. You guys were close to the actual Broadway honkin' tonkin', like Robert's Western World and all that, which is where the actual, oh, yeah. like, Hank Williams and the early Opry stars hung out. Like, that's the legit Broadway. Uh, you guys stayed in your hotel near, like, the more college kid songwriter. Yeah, Vandy. Sla it's, like, it's like Slash songwriter, like some famous, I don't know how old those bars are uh, over off of that, like what we call, it's called Division Street. You know, mm -hmm. I, I assume lots of famous songwriters have been there, but you know, that's not exciting. The, the exciting was... is the Johnny Cash and, and June Carter drank here after, you know, they would perform at, at the Ryman Auditorium. So like the downtown Nashville is... There's the stretch that's very old and been there a long time. You guys were like two blocks off of that, which is all like blown up and pretty brand new. So you are right yeah, there. Yeah, like like all like country stars branding bars and stuff like that. Yeah, so it's yeah, like yeah. Al Alan Jackson's Bar right. and Grill or whatever, <laughs> right, which is all right, like right. I'm sure is fine. You know, it was it's weird because there was like a cool any place where there's just like constantly that much music happening is kind of cool to me in the abstract. But then when you get closer to it, it's like there isn't necessarily that much good live music that any city could have going at, at any time. It's the same thing. Like new Orleans even has a little bit of this too, where like at some point you just realize that there's like a lot of people covering like, you know, Barracuda or whatever, <laughs> right, in new Orleans. Right. or in like Nashville, where it's just like a lot of people that, you know, are just, and I wish them all well and I hope they all succeed and stuff like that. But there was something about it that felt kind of like, uh, Especially that area, like it all just felt a little forced, I guess. <laughs> but I think that there's like, I, again, like I don't know how to find the center of a city. We had a, a beautiful dinner the night before. I walked and I had like a good cup of coffee and some decent uh, like barbecue-y stuff the day of the actual deadcast. But then we went home, you know, like so I didn't really I, – I would have liked to have – I think I was there long enough to get the sense that I would have liked to have spent more time I'm, there. I'm – I have grown my older age to a all cities are sort of the same Out, I think that that's, outside yeah. of like, you know, obviously there's famous things in Nashville. There's famous things in most cities and there's famous like old events that happen in most cities. And then you have your, you know, you have your major metropolises is metropola. I metro M metropolitan. There's three eyes. Yeah. All right. <laughs> yeah. Like, like, a, you know, a, a New York, a Chicago, like they have all these things, but again, you can't, you know, if every city, it's like if everyone is like, show me your best five things, most cities are kind of the same. It's yes, like, I think that's, I don't know to what extent that's, because you and I are, are roughly the same age. Uh, yeah. And I think some of that is maybe just, you know, that as we get older, the the experiences that we're having or that either like we're choosing to like sort of pursue, like I definitely went and got like fancy hipster coffee in Nashville <laughs> right, and it right. was delicious but like I do that everywhere I go so the idea of it being like you know somehow like oh well, this is just like San Francisco which is just like you know wherever it's like maybe it's just that I'm a fucking idiot you know what I mean like there's <laughs> definitely you can't rule that out 
But I think that there's something – definitely I think places start to seem – more alike, and especially a place like Nashville, where there's so many construction crews on the, or, you know, cranes on the horizon. There's clearly so much new stuff being built throughout the city that, like, once you start relying on the the imagination of real estate developers, like, yes, places do start <laughs> to seem very much alike because all those guys have this; they just share one brain. It's like I think when I travel, I think of things that are make an indelible mark. Like I went to Jerusalem, and I could be like. That's the temple. Yeah. Jesus right. of only- Nazareth stood here. We know that, you know. Right. There's only one of them. It's like you're not like, oh, well, that's just right. like the one in Cincinnati where Jesus was. And then if I'm in like, like New York City, I'm like, oh, this bar's cool. Hey, they carry my brand. Yeah, I'll have Jack Daniels. That's great. Yeah, yeah. I know, which is kind of – and, you know, there's some of that is on is on us for seeking that sort of thing out. But there is definitely, you know, there's only so much you can do when you're just passing through a place or whatever. You know, I think – we cut ourselves some sort of slack. Like if I'm getting, if I'm in Los Angeles and I get a good taco, I don't need to like, and I know that I'm getting it from a place that people that live in Los Angeles consider to be a good taco. Like I'm fine with it. I don't need to, to inconvenience myself to get another taco to feel like I'm having a different sort of experience. Cause I'm, you know, I'm only there for like five days and I love eating tacos. <laughs> That's right. I mean, if you, if you can example. tell me like Humphrey Bogart, ate at this taco place. I'm like, I'm cool with it. Like the, like the old restaurants in LA, that's fun. I like movie stars. I like thinking about like old people have been here, but again, yeah, it, it, the, the world is homogenized. We can have good meals everywhere. Good music everywhere. Uh, I did go, sorry, go, oh, ahead. go ahead. No, I was just going to say that I saw, um, you, you top chef guy, Keith, not really, but I'm, I'm okay. like, uh, sort of aware. Like adjacent, yeah, I saw Tom Colicchio in a restaurant in Los Angeles, and I was like, oh, that's good. That's the sort of famous person I want to see here. It was like him, or I would have really loved to have seen like Michael Olo a candy or something like that, but I don't think he spends a lot of time in the city anymore. Yeah, I don't. I, I wonder where the candy man's living right now. Well, he's probably got like a private island someplace who's just cooling out. Uh, well, so speaking of every place is kind of the same, and we're just fine to move back and forth between them, that's my segue to LeBron James and the Lakers. Oh, nicely done. Nah, I don't know about that. Uh, That's so right. the, we'll LeBron James is currently, you know, spending a couple seasons, apparently, in Los Angeles. This one, not going well. Uh, they're they're a bad <laughs> team, Keith. They're a clown show, and they suck ass, and I hate watching them. I, and they're always on TV. I couldn't wrap my brain around the Lakers not making the playoffs and being bad. Like, even when they signed LeBron James, and even when everyone made all our jokes about like, why would they sign Michael Beasley? Why would they sign Rajon Rondo? Why do they do all these things? These are terrible, but it doesn't matter. LeBron James has made eight straight finals. He's going to make the playoffs. I couldn't wrap my brain around it. Um, it's kind of like global warming. I can't wrap my brain around the world ending. So yeah. it's probably it not going to happen. It's too vast. Yeah. To it's too big. So, uh, yeah. So the Lakers now find themselves uh, in a deep world of hurt. They're, they're three games behind the Clippers. The Clippers who have traded away their best players like at eight month intervals over the last y- two years. Yep. Uh, and they still and who seemed are better. <laughs> very, yeah. The Clippers seem, I'd say, uh, comparatively intent on not making the playoffs. And yet here they are. And I feel like it's got to be, I mean, just the little bit that I know. I went to school in Los Angeles uh, and I became a Clippers fan there because I'm an idiot and treat myself poorly. Right. <laughs> and. This was like during the like Lamar Odom administration. Like these were very bad Clipper teams. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but I think that for the Clippers, like it would be great to not make the playoffs, keep a lottery pick, and you know get like DeAndre Hunter or some good like lower lottery guy to add to your collection of whoever it is that they're able to sign this offseason. Everybody says Kawhi. I don't know if that's going to be quite as easy as it sounds, but I mean like. They're they're not far away from being a good team. They're already very spunky and very deep and all that. But practically speaking, the best thing for them to do is not make the playoffs this year. And yet, I think that like if the choice is between keep the Lakers out of the playoffs and keep the 13th pick of the draft, like I kind of respect that the Clippers are sort of like, you know what, let me think about it. No, you got you got to do it. I, I feel like the storyline that they're better off, you know, with like that 13th pick. I'm not I'm not buying it completely because I think they assume they're going to sign someone good in the offseason. If that's Kawhi yeah. Leonard or someone else. And then they'll still have the same thing next year. I think I think I'm pretty sure that pick 
they have to convey it next year, even if it's not uh, lottery protected. So the, yeah. I don't think they're holding on to it for two straight years. And I do feel like the victory of keeping the Lakers out of the playoffs of doing this, like, you know what, Chris Paul, uh, well, let's trade him. Uh, Blake Griffin. No, no, we don't, we don't want him. We'll take Tobias Harris and, and get rid of him. Oh, we don't want Tobias Harris. Let's just get rid of him too. And Oh Lakers, we're not even going to play. We're not even going to start our best two players. Like Lou Williams and Montrezl Harrell, now they're bench players. Like we're not even we're going to start just other guys, and still is, we're going to uh, beat the Lakers into the playoffs. And you got LeBron James. I'm kind of fascinated by the Clippers roster construction in general because it seems like they like they built the whole team out of the rotation, like which is really it doesn't seem like that weird a thing where it's just like oh all your players should be good, but like they didn't. There's not like that sort of like stars and scrubs thing that happens with just that the salary cap generally forces on teams, and it's because I you know that they did get rid of the guys that were getting paid the most um, up to and including like Tobias Harris and all these guys that were getting like, you know, middle class, upper middle class salaries now. But like they did a terrific job, like I, for all the shit that Doc has taken as a GM in the past and stuff like that, that like it seems like the as a coach, I think he's pretty solid. And I think that he's got a lot of different players to use now. And I, I mean, I kind of had this hope that they would let some of those guys that they would deal from that to, you know, give those dudes a chance to play in the playoffs, like set Patrick Beverly free <laughs> and let him go someplace where he can annoy people like deep into the summer. But I, you know, again, I respect them sticking with it and doing what they're doing. It is also weird that, uh, that Williams and Harrell, I mean, they still, they wind up playing as many minutes as anybody else, but there is something weird about the fact that like, not just like in terms of like raw numbers or whatever, but like when you watch them, the two most effective players they have don't begin games on right. the floor. And I, I feel like their fans are getting a little antsy about like, why do we do this? Why do we start the first six minutes of each half like without our, our best players? Yeah. And I know, Dan- like, I know Danilo Gallinari, I don't want to slide him. I know he was the kind of the quote unquote nerdy pick for all star uh, snub over Tobias Harris. Uh, Danilo Gallinari, who hunts fouls with the same whatever fervor of James Harden and gets none of the grief for it. He just falls yeah. down all the time. He just drives in the lane and falls down and he gets the same thing. But like, I know he's very efficient because of that, but like, you know, Lou Williams has been, uh, he's been a stud and uh, he's going to him and Montrezl might split that sixth man vote. Someone might swoop yeah. in. I don't know what the uh, Academy award um, analogy did anyone split Fucking the vote Nick, last Nick, night? I haven't. I, Nick Vallelonga again. I don't even know. I can't believe he won NBA Sixth Man of the Year award after the whole Green Book thing, but it's, I'm <laughs> impressed. <laughs> Nicky Lip. Yeah. So uh, for the Lakers, who right now again they can still make it, but I'm looking at their schedule. They they have 14 more games against teams currently over 500. It's a really tough. It's one of the I, somebody was talking about this at work today. It's like one of the 10 most difficult schedules at, uh, down the stretch, which would be bad for any team. But like, the, I mean, have you watched? Yeah. Like, they're trash. They're, they're very bad. They're really bad right now and getting worse. Uh, they, they were recording this on Monday afternoon. So uh, lame duck style. I'll release this tomorrow. They play my Memphis Grizzlies in Memphis tonight. The Memphis Grizzlies, who are one of the worst teams in the NBA. But beyond that, I feel like best case scenario, they, they can they can win 44 games. Like looking at their schedule, I'm talking best case scenario. That's like them upsetting the Bucks, them upsetting mm-hmm. the Raptors. Like they're, they're playing these teams multiple times. Like uh, uh, it's going to be a mess. And it does feel like now that this team is not going to make it. Uh, if this team misses the playoffs, which looks uh, probable, uh, what, what do you think the end game is for LeBron James this season? Like is there anything he can do? I have an idea that how maybe he what he's going to do to preserve his legacy. But like, what do you think he's going to even put out there uh, if like the season finally gets away from him and he's like, you know what, we, <sighs> we can't do it. It's a good question. I mean, I think that cause especially because it's, it seems like it's been established now with the Anthony Davis stuff that like this kind of young core of players that they have, like that most of those guys just really aren't that good. Uh they're like, you know, people that could be useful players for an NBA team, but it's not the sort of thing where you can be like, we're going to give you like the number two pick of the draft two years ago, the number like three pick of the draft the year before that or whatever. Like it, as soon as you attach the names of those actual players to them, they're sort of like, no, that's not worth enough for Anthony Davis. Thank oh, you sure. very much. Yeah, yeah. Like the <laughs> like whatever, like tall Ramon Sessions is not really uh, <laughs> <laughs> ring any bells for anyone, but I mean, I don't know what because he likes to talk about LeBron loves to talk about, you know, taking people under his wing and whatever. And I think it, it's just that, like, maybe he has realized that 
these are guys that would not necessarily benefit from that. I mean, I think he, it, the part of it that's surprising me is I, I really do think he generally does make his teammates better. And to see like, uh, I mean, all of those guys, except for, for, I guess, Kuzma are actively rowing backwards this year. Right. Right. From, I- where they were last year. And I don't know what, I mean, I guess it probably involves Luke Walton getting fired, but I don't know how like LeBron exactly salvages I, this. I, I mean, it's a, it's a failed season. He's also, <laughs> you know, the best basketball player I ever saw. So I'm not going to complain about it too much, but I, I think we're going to get in a, in a, like three weeks, we're going to start getting some, some reports of LeBron James medical issues. And maybe this, this hurt groin never fully healed. And mm-hmm. then, so then, and then LeBron is going to come out and, and, you know, like with a couple weeks left in the season, they're, they're going to shut LeBron down. And he's going to say something like, you know, for the first time in my life, my body did not recuperate the way I anticipated I've been playing through this stuff, you know, and, and, and I, you know, I, I tried to play through injury. I could not do it, you know? And so I think, so that way uh, the basketball narrative can be LeBron missed the playoffs because he got injured. You can look at it pre injury. They were still, you know, they were in a playoff spot They They were hanging in there. And then maybe he can just paint this to like, you know, I got hurt. That's why we missed the playoffs. Yeah. I mean, it's still going to be the sort of thing where like if he decides that that to me seems like kind of gilding the lily on his part. But it's still going to be when you look at his stat line this year, it's going to be I mean, he'll have played in 60 games or something. Right. Yeah. (laughs) And that's still going to stand out on the rest of his career. And I don't know that. I mean, it just depends on how much he uh, trusts the legacy of going to eight straight finals against like the whatever the one year of being on like a team with a drowsy and ineffective Lance Stevenson. (laughs) What I don't get is how like, this is, it's kind of classic. Like whenever he goes to a new team, he likes to like have his guys with him. Like he like, and he has uh, just terrible tasting guys. (laughs) He really does. Like eventually like he works itself out in the long run and stuff like that. But it's like, you know, he's loyal to his dudes and I respect that, but not me. I like the influencers. Sorry. Well, the guys, the guys that he's most loyal to, it seems like, are the whatever, just the kind of like weed carrier dudes, like just well, like yeah. James Jones and Mike Miller and like Big Z. And in this case, I, I mean, I don't, I would not have guessed that he was like, get me Lance. I will like, say, that Ma- Mike Miller carried team. his weight. All right, Mike Miller, he, yeah. he you know, he, he was good. He, he won a, a, fi- good he won a finals player. game. Yeah, he was just also like by the time, by the very end. Right. I mean, sure. he was, yeah. And then when they were filling out the final spots in those Cavs teams, right. He didn't, didn't really need to be there. Uh, just like going alphabetically through LeBron's phone. <laughs> like if his, if his name had started with an S, he would not have been on those rosters. Right. Uh, let's, let's switch it over to, uh, your neck of the woods in New York. Uh, r- real quick. I want to hit a couple of these teams. Uh, I will say when you I had you on over the summer, I, I was giving you a hard time. Cause you, you know, you, you also, while you, uh, had a little dalliance with the Clippers, you, you also liked the Nets and uh, yeah. I was giving you a hard time that I thought everyone was talking about the Nets too much. You, uh, you, you did uh, concede they were getting a lot of praise for uh, what you called GM cosplay, which I really enjoyed. But uh, <laughs> I will say the Nets, I've come around on them. They're very, very fun. Uh, maybe they, yeah, maybe they're spunky, they right? The right thing. I mean, they're not good. They're still they're, in a but, playoff race but, with the Pistons and the Hornets and the Magic. But they're, I like them. I, I do like them a lot this year, and, and I've come around to finding them quite enjoyable. Yeah, they're definitely the the fun kind of not good. Like <laughs> right, whereas like right. the Pistons I think are like I, you know they've I to me if anything like sort of over like I thought they were be a disaster this year and instead they're just kind of mediocre. Right. And I think some of it is just that there's like some real like ornery good Blake Griffin basketball being played there right now. It's not like fun to watch cuz it's not that's not really where he's at. Uh, at this point in his career, but the Nets kind of are fun to watch because it's just like waves of able enough dudes trying extremely hard uh and coached creatively yeah which it's like you know when you don't have any lottery picks for multiple years like that's about the best you can hope for it is you know it, it's like they're they're better than the kings but it's sort of similar and the kings have had a lot of their picks but the way that they played this year where they were just kind of like all right well we don't have a pick it doesn't matter we should try to make the playoffs and like the kings are kind of spicy too I mean, they make a ton of mistakes and everything like that but there's something about especially once a team gets good uh, that these are the teams you, I think that you tend to look back on most fondly. Yeah, that that makes sense. I, again, like they're not the Nets as much as I've been enjoying them and pumping them up recently. They're not as good as they are in my mind. Like they're actually not like they. If they were in the Western Conference, they they might be behind the Timberwolves. 
like as far as it oh, yeah. turns out. Yeah. But, they, but again, like players. they've gotten all the, the positive uh, the positive praise. Th- their schedule is getting hard down the stretch, so they still might slip out, but uh, I do apologize once again uh, to the Nets. The other team in this city, uh, the New York Knicks, which is... Really living up to expectations. They, they shipped Porzingis out. They cleared the deck. They're hoping to bring in Durant. Uh, they lost something like... I, don't, I can't remember what it was. They lost 17 straight games. They lost something... Yep. Uh, they'd lost a bunch of home games in a row. I know they, they finally broke the home game streak uh, on... Against the Spurs. Well, against the Spurs on Oscar Sunday night. They were playing against the Oscars, which I thought was really strange. Uh, while Spike Lee... <laughs> So tell me, what, what level of losing is this? Sp- Spike Lee <laughs> was not present for the How Knicks. How owned is Spike Lee? First home win in like two months. And in addition, his, his film uh, lost in the best picture <laughs> category to a, a film about race relations directed by a Farrelly brother. That's tough. Like what level yeah, um, is that Charles Smith against the Bulls level losing? What's, like what's, what level of losing is that? <laughs> You know that I don't throw that particular metaphor around uh, very because it's I don't even care about the Knicks and I'm just like I think about it. It's, it's, it's you know, sensitive. It's like yeah. kind of chill runs up your spine. That said, uh, it's pretty fucking intense. Like that is a bad <laughs> way to go out right there. I mean, he still got to go to the Oscars and he didn't have to go to a Knicks game or whatever. But right, yeah, wow. <laughs> they I, I've watched a little bit of them this year and like the Knicks are a, another team that again like bad though they are like are at least like sassy moment to moment. I don't really understand a lot of what Fizz is doing with the rotation there. Exactly. Like he's like the, like uh, Manuel Moutier played a lot more for a lot longer than uh, anybody should have uh, permitted to happen. And as it is, it's like, I'd still not exactly clear that their, their young players are developing. I think the Porzingis thing's a bummer or whatever, but there are definitely bad teams and even recent Knicks, bad teams that have been more excruciating than this. I think in part because it's not the the Isaiah Thomas bad team model where there's like somehow they're also capped out and everybody on the team is 31. Right. Yeah. Those 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 were darker. They, they've at least yeah. spun this into a storyline of hope, which you can choose to believe if you want to. I do like the as you said, like the the shuffling rotations. I I mean, our listeners know that I'm a. I believe David Fisdale is a charlatan, and I, I find it very amu- really? I find it very amusing. I don't mean that in any excessively negative connotations. I think he's not a very good coach who says a lot of really hilarious things when you realize that, he's not a coach, like a, like a very you know, good coach. The the Knicks fans that I talk to about that team with uh, agree with you. I think okay. <laughs> that like they, they, he seems like well again it's sort of hard to tell because it's like that. You know, the same way that like everybody was like, oh, Brett Brown's a great coach and his team won like, you know, 21 games over three seasons or some shit. You're just like, all right, well, I'll take your word for that. Like there's no (laughs) there's no way to tell, you know, like the the guys liked him and he, you know, and they played hard, but they weren't good. You know, this isn't a good roster that Fisdale has. But I think that there's this sense that's kind of like sneaking up on a lot of Knicks fans where they're like, well, this man is very likable and clearly like very well oh, respected. Incredibly likable. Uh, very very also, fun to listen to talk. Yeah. He, uh, he, did, he did some great stuff in Memphis and getting Confederate monuments removed. Great guy, personally. Yeah, uh, that but, itself yeah, is a it, career highlight. Jeff Hornacek never did that shit. That's right. Jeff Hornacek also never scored 40 points in a basketball game. Uh, anyway, I was, yeah, all right. I, was looking that, I was I was looking that up for a Pascal Siakam. I was uh, celebrating the Pascal Siakam forty four point night, and I was like, "What are some random uh, highest points?" Anyway, I got distracted. Del, uh, <laughs> Delk is my go to for that. It's right, Tony Delk. Right. Is Delk. Weird... See, I was going the other way. I was like, I need to find guys who didn't. Like, I know Delk scored fifty. I know Terrence Ross scored fifty. And you go the other way. Like, who who never scored thirty five? John Stockton. There you go. Really? Yeah, I think his career high was thirty five. Well, that's yeah. I mean, I guess it makes sense. Like what, like the John Stockton game does not involve him just like <laughs> right. crossing people over while the oh, the and one announcer yells "Oh baby!" Like it's really a lot, very different vibe. But with Fisdale, it's 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 weird. Like because he's in this sort of like zone of no consequence or whatever. But then like if you give him, you know what the if the best case scenario plays out for the Knicks and they wind up with two max talents or whatever. Mm-hmm. Uh, does he use them intelligently? Like I haven't seen any evidence that he's necessarily capable of that. I don't know that he isn't either. He doesn't, I mean like the team has no good players on it, Yeah. but there is something about him that feels, especially given the way that, that they've managed. I mean, they were supposed to lose this season, right. but 
uh, on top of that, there's something about it that doesn't quite smell right. There's also like there's also supposed to lose, and there's also like, oh yeah, I'm not going to play Frank Nilakina at all. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not right. like That's... Mitchell Robinson. Let's 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 set him on the block for a while. Let's let's see what no let's see what Noah Vonley and Luke Cornett have. You know, like I mean, I guess Luke Cornett is still a young guy. You know, but and Von, Vonley weirdly is like 25. Yeah, I mean, it was, and this is the first year I think that he's actively looked good to me. I know he was like useful in Portland, right? But the like again, I don't. You give him credit for developing. I, whatever the idea that like yeah he made a player out of Noah Vonley and made a freaking bench warmer like D League yo yo dude out of Lakina like is stupid. To me. <laughs> well, like, and also Vonley's a guy they're probably job. not going to keep in any way. No, they don't have like yeah but, he's a one year contract. But, but, I mean it's it's good for you know him, but ideally like with a guy like that if you make him into a contributor then you try to trade him right. Yeah, I'm gonna say right. I'm gonna say Spike Lee, Spike Lee losing uh to the reverse driving Miss Daisy movie again. Uh, is just going to be uh, Patrick Ewing missing the last second layup against the Pacers. Uh, to, I don't know what year that was. Yeah. I can... Not, I, I, it's, I know the period. Yeah, uh, it, it wasn't a team they were expecting to go to the finals and win it, but it was still a painful playoff loss. Uh, yeah, was, but it wasn't Charles loss. Smith missing five layups in yeah. eight seconds. To go up on the Bulls. I, li- I like the, uh, that Dave Fisdale lives in the zone of no consequence, which is incredibly true. May we all have the opportunity yeah, to, some, to sometime like live in the zone of no consequence. That's aspiring a, to a job. Like, I don't, can you tell if I'm doing a good job or a bad job at Deadspin? Is there any way to assess it? I don't know. No one knows what my job is or what is, am I hitting my marks? Hard to say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't. I mean, what, what measure do any of us, any of us have? Really? That's kind of the, Click, yeah, clicks and listens. I don't know. Uh, yeah, not, I don't. Let's. Not, that's a little too concrete for me. Not going great right, let's, there. Talk, <laughs> let's talk about vibe. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, well, last question. Um, All right, Fizdale just th- did throw this out. Uh, he he was blaming some of the Knicks' losses on Fortnite. David Roth is Fortnite <laughs> ruining the New York Knicks? I can't see how it's helping. You know, like I there was a we were talking about this at work the other day and someone reminded me that when he was drafted uh kevin knox was wearing a blazer into the lining of which Fortnite had been there was like a silk inlay oh. on the inside of it of the word Fortnite with like characters from the game and there's like, photos of him posing like holding it up being like check this shit out i'm <laughs> 11 years old that's and i feel like that's not a I don't know enough about video games to really hold forth on this, but I'm I'm going to do it. I just wanted to sure caveat please. that before I start. Uh, that to me seems like a child's video game, okay. and like and if it turned out that all these guys as a team that they were just hanging out together and playing like Call of Duty or something like that, which again it makes sense because a lot of these dudes can't actually go to bars. Yeah, like not like anybody's in them out or whatever, but like Mitchell Robinson's like. 17 yeah you know like he should be playing Fortnite. a lot of these guys maybe that's what they they want to do but like play a, a proper grown man's video game i think <laughs> don't play a game where there's like a bunch of like nine-year-olds in headsets I, like being like pound in like their little child voices at you i like that your take you went the jim boylan route you went the that's a child's video game these guys yeah. need to play men's video games that'll get them ready yeah, for like the a, rigors of the nba season yeah, something like either a game where uh, where they're wasting zombies yeah, or it sure. takes place in some sort of, uh, you know, or like any one of our current ongoing military misadventures, something like that. <laughs> they could show them the power of responsibility. Also, whatever, if you ever playing like some, I, again, I what do you think about well, this? So, you, you actually have children. I would, so I would like to, board. I feel like there's a sports take possible here that I could get behind. Because the argument when you when you criticize the coach for blaming Fortnite, you're like, these guys know they're in their hotel rooms, they're hanging out, they're being safe, they're not going to bars, they're not fraternizing with who knows what. Like they're just they're they're, they're being responsible. They're they're I think they're staying up till three drinking like whatever. Well, so do code red, then, but that's fine. Then part of me thinks, is it actually better? And there's no science or medical knowledge behind what I'm about to say. Is there a thought that maybe going Caveat to the bar, to sure. having On some point. depressants, drinking some booze, then maybe, you know, hitting some street food, getting some some late night junk food, going back to the hotel and crashing at 5 a.m.? That's one thing the guys used to do. Maybe that does that help you rest better? 
than staying up all night on a mentally stimulating like synapses firing video game pounding health food so like you go through the whole night like 8 a.m 9 a.m 10 a.m you're like well i guess i should get a nap before practice like right is is the booze and junk food where you have like a natural your body crashes at 6 a.m and then you actually sleep hard is that better i feel like now, if i was a red-blooded sports podcast host i would push that angle really hard yeah i think i was gonna say like i can't in good faith advocate for that but <laughs> <laughs> I do think I would I would really love to hear somebody advocate for it because I, there's a part of me that kind of believes it. I mean, it just depends like partying like a like an NBA basketball player has meant different things at different times. But now that it means like uh, wearable biometric devices and like just eating a lot of like steamed skinless chicken breast and whatever, yeah. like the fact that we're now like that we've gone all this other way, like maybe they should get maybe soft pretzels are the next big breakthrough like soft pretzels eaten on a street corner waiting for an Uber at like three fifty one AM NBA like, players are too healthy. Yeah. Zig where everybody it's else hurting is their bagging. bodies. Yeah. I think, and you know what, if, if we both kind of think it and or want to think it, then it's probably true. Yeah. That's how I'm going. All these, <laughs> th- th- they've spaced out the schedule. There's fewer back to backs, no more four games in five nights. Injury rates have not been affected whatsoever. You shouldn't be exercising around the calendar every week, every day. Jimmy Butler getting hurt with this. They're too healthy. Yeah. You're not built for that. Kawhi sort of thing. Leonard with a degenerative quad issue. Larry Bird never, oh, that's a bad example. Yeah, it is actually. Uh. <laughs> Take somebody else. But yeah, the I, I mean, the obvious one would be that like Michael Jordan slept uh, like 95 hours a year <laughs> right, while right. he was playing. And it was all because he was constantly like just jetting across the international date line to find new people to gamble with between games. Like now, did that make him Michael Jordan? Probably not. Yeah. But I can't disprove it. It was good enough for Anthony Mason. It's good enough for Anthony <laughs> Davis. All right. Yeah, let's not look into what age Anthony Mason passed away at. Oh. Focus on <laughs> it's not great. I, 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 have, I have had Anthony Mason on the brain because Dion waiters looks like a very round short version of him right now on the heat. Anyway. So can I give you one Anthony Mason thing before we go. Oh, I know yeah. we do have to oh, go. Yeah. So you mentioned earlier that I was a Nets fan. Yeah. Um, as a kid, I was a fan of some extremely bad New Jersey Nets teams. Uh, like, before they started rocking the kind of like, do you remember the like tie dyed uniform that they used to wear? It's kind of like sky blue and white. Tie dyed? No, it was weird looking. Well, yeah, I remember. I remember um, well, did Aaron Aaron Williams wore like a light? Maybe I don't know. I, I'm let me I'm Google this. No, Keep it was going. this was Aaron Williams team after that. So okay. this was the the first Nets teams of my lifetime that made the playoffs was like Drazen Petrovic, Kenny Anderson, and Derek Coleman. Oh, okay. And I'm looking and at Dwayne, yeah, right. and Dwayne Shinsius. And those guys wore some truly outrageous early nineties uniforms. Before that, they were still wearing some version of the like Dr. J, like New York Nets uniforms, yeah. like with the stars down the side. And Anthony Mason's first NBA job, as far as I know, was a 10 day contract on one of those teams at the end of the year. And he had already been in the CBA and uh, had been a really unusually contemporary scorer in college. Like he took a lot of threes. Like he was a lot of stuff that you wouldn't maybe necessarily expect from Anthony Mason, um, even having seen him, you know, become objectively a very good player later in his career. And I remember watching him um, as a 10 day guy with the Nets. And, you know, it's hard possible to tell because it's garbage time. They're getting blown out by the Pacers and, you know, neither team cares. But I think that was the first bit of like looking at a random guy on the nets and being like, I think that player is actually good and should be a net. And it was, I'm sure that I had that thought many times. It was, as far as I know, the only time I was right. (laughs) That's a, that's a beautiful, lovely little uh, Anthony, uh, Anthony Mason anecdote. He also is a very, uh, I think he's the trivia is a very difficult trivia question. I think he was like an all-star for the Bob Hornets. There was some weird Bucks. He was a possibly with the well, wait, or the Heat, and he. I know he was the because he almost was averaged a, a triple double one season, and it's like a yeah. it's a really weird standout season. And when you do one of those basketball reference, like seven assists, seven rebounds, ten points, and it's like Anthony, what? Yeah, and it was one of the teams he's not most associated with, and then he retired very shortly after that. I want to say it was the Bucks, but I don't know. He was uh, he did not get along with George Carl. I don't know if that surprises you. Yeah, he averaged. Um, <laughs> Yeah, there was a Charlotte Hornets season where he's averaging 10 points. Or no, yeah, yeah. 
16 points, 11 rebounds, and almost six assists for the Charlotte Hornets in 96-97. Led the NBA in minutes per game. There you go. Some real Sean Marion <laughs> hours from Anthony Davis. Yeah. All right. Well, David, hey, thanks so much for your time. Uh, you have anything you want to plug besides Corbin Smith? Uh, yeah. I mean, um, like John Wilms is writing a piece for us soon. Of course, he co-hosts Corbin's podcast. Yeah. Uh, I can't think of I don't know. I do a Hallmark podcast with Jeb Lund called Dave and Jeb Aren't Mean. That That's fun as well. But yeah, I don't know. Otherwise, yeah, deadspin.com. Obviously, uh, Fast Break Breakfast, my favorite podcast. Oh, so sweet of you. Even better than Corbin's, because you didn't send me 9,000 words on a basketball team from 20 years ago. I can't write, as I have established. <laughs> Terrific. <laughs> I'm really, really bad at it. <laughs> That's why you're the best, baby. Yeah. Anyway, uh, David, thanks again. I look forward to talking with you again soon sometime. Right on. Thanks for having me, dude. All right. Thanks to David for coming on once again. Very entertaining fellow. Very fun guy to talk to. Check out his stuff over at Deadspin. Uh, you will sure to enjoy. If you want to support our show, uh, patreon.com slash fastbreakbreakfast, or use that SeatGeek app and enter our promo code fastbreakbreak so you get $20 off your first purchase of tickets on the secondary market at SeatGeek. Those are great ways to support us. Uh, now it's time for me to queue up this DVR and watch some Jonas Valanciunas, Joachim Noah, unstoppable Twin Towers action against the LeBron Lakers, who are, again, the theme of this episode, are in deep, deep doo-doo. All right, you can follow me on Twitter at Fast Break Break. You can follow us on Instagram and on Twitter. You guys are the best. Thanks for listening. And remember, breakfast is the most important thing. Yeah, never apologize for being G&G. Fair break, break, man. You understand? Seeky saves you time and saves you money. Two of the more important commodities in our lives these days. They aggregate ticket selling sites together. So you don't have to go to eight sites and then, oh, I'm going to look at the ninth one now because I'm not quite sure. I was totally that way, of course. And then they also rank every ticket based on value. So you look at the section you want to sit in, find that big green dot the darker green the better you'll you'll start to experience just endorphins when you see that green dot and know that you're getting an awesome deal on the ticket i used seek geek to go to a bucks wizards game got awesome seats there for my uh, fiance and me so the way to get started with them download the seek geek app and enter that familiar promo code fast break break by using that code to get twenty dollars off your first seat geek purchase that's promo code fast break Break. For $20 off your first SeatGeek purchase, let them know that you came from us. Fast break break. John is an asshole. Fast break break.